Hi, everyone. My name is Matt Belitsky. I work at a company called Talkable. We are a referral marketing automation platform. I'm here to talk to you today about referral marketing as an acquisition channel. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, it's my first time using this clicker, so I'm just going to try it out. I'm just going to stick to my, my hands here. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I framed this presentation into three specific sections. So here we have why referral marketing works, uh, five steps to building your program, and then referrals do, do and don'ts. And then afterwards, I can take any kind of questions that you have, try my best to answer them. Um, so a little bit about me and what I do and who we are. So my name is Matt Belitsky. Um, I wrote the book on referral marketing. Um, last year when I started at Talkable, um, I had done some research before joining and said, you know, why does referral marketing work? I've, I see all these like best practice guides about how things should work and how things can work, but not why they actually work. And so what I did is I um, worked with the team to put together research and understand the fundamentals behind human decision making, uh, influence, uh, perception, scarcity of products, uh, influence, and we put together a book that is the handbook from science to purchase of uh, a handbook on referral marketing. So wrote this, very proud of it, exists on our site right now on the homepage. I hope that uh, some of you go and take a look at it. Um, a lot of the basis of the presentation today uh, comes from the foundation of the research and work that was done to go into this book. So I hope that um, this is meaningful for you. I've been working at Talkable as the director of revenue. I came in and um, started building up a large pipeline, um, doing a lot of demand generation, um, then moved in towards our customer success account management team. So technically my title now is Director of Revenue, um, Generation and Retention. So anything that touches revenue I'm uh, getting involved with, which is exciting and nerve wracking and exciting. Um, and so that's where I've been spending most of my time. Um, it's exciting to see uh, our company grow so drastically over the last 12 months. Um, at this time last year we had 18 customers, now we have 80. Um, and a lot of them have been referred to each other through referral marketing, word of mouth. So it's great to see that um, even referral marketing works uh, for our own referral marketing business. Um, cool. So I just wanted to kind of ask the group when the last time you made a decision was. I'm sure some of you just made it by saying, should we attend this? <laughs> Who's this person? Right? Um, so did you make the decision alone? Were you influenced by someone else? Did you see somebody else coming over? The reason I ask is because from our research and from my understanding, most people make decisions because they see other people doing the same thing and they're heavily influenced. We have a Nielsen stat here, 84% of people trust product and brand recommendations of people they know. Um, it's pretty obvious that everyone here has asked a friend or family in the purchase decision making process before what they thought, before they made one. And I think that we all know uh, the power of referral. Um, I, I don't wanna get too in the weeds of how um, decision making works and the, the psychology behind decision making. It's all in that book that I talked about. If you're interested, check it out. If you have any questions, happy to answer them. But um, effectively, I just wanted to get on the same page that referral marketing works. Uh, when you have a loyal brand advocate who's willing to share your brand experience, your product, your message, and invite their friends, it's a hyper-targeted um, way of getting new customers into your product, into um, interacting with your product. And um, from this point forward, we'll just assume that it works. So I'm going to keep moving forward. So Talkable, um, we've grown immensely over the last um, year or so, but we've been around for a couple. And we have here a couple of roster clients up there. I'm sure some of you might know one or two of at least some of these brands up here. All of these companies have implemented a referral program uh, and they're all thriving, doing extremely well. Um, they've all implemented a referral through Talkable, which is the company I'm working at. And we like to think that we've been able to add um, additional service and support and all sorts of uh, great fundamentals for them to um, start with and then expand upon. Um, and so what I wanted to tell you today is when I share this insight with you, I feel confident in being able to explain my point of view and our point of view, 
because we've done it so many times before and for so many of these great clients. So um, I hope that you appreciate the insights I'm able to provide. Um, so as I drill in, uh, I'm going to go through five steps, the five steps of creating your referral strategy. And then after that, I'm going to drill into some examples, um, specifically of how Talkable is helping um, specific companies achieve some of these goals. Um, and it'll be more interactive then. But from the beginning, let's start talking about uh, identifying your objective. So the first step, which I'm sure many of you have done already, is is referral, is referral something that can solve what I'm trying to determine right now? Can I acquire new customers? Can I increase the LTV of current customers? Um, is this a strategy I want to pursue? What kind of investment goes into it? Is this something I should be looking into? I hope after today's presentation you have more insight. Um, but effectively, the first place to start is to identify your objective. Um, the next thing we have is identifying your audience. So um, there are several um, point solution uh, referral marketing widgets out there. And um, the sales strategy that they use is once you install uh, a referral marketing screen on your site, it should just work for you. And that's what a lot of companies do. Um, one of the core practices we have at Talkable is doing segmentation, right? Instead of painting a broad stroke and hitting every single person with the same offer, there have to be ways of identifying specific individuals or sub subgroups within segmentation. Um, are there high value customers through e-commerce? Are there subscribers who you think are more engaged than others? Um, based on those criteria, it's important to define the target and the segment to pursue. And in addition to that, where is this audience going to see the offer to be able to take advantage of it? So here we have placement. So for example, we could be looking at an e-commerce company that has a list of VIP customers who spend over, let's say, $5,000 a year. And you've identified who those people are. You probably don't want the referral offer for those people who you want essentially to bring in more people like them to be the same offer as someone who makes a purchase once and leaves. So hopefully with that additional insight, you can either map out all of your segments and determine what the different um, incentives would be for each, or start with one segment and then expand from there. Um, in addition, where is it that this group of people is going to see an offer to take advantage of? Is it going to be post-purchase? Um, as a pop-up automatically? Is it going to be when they first hit the site? Is it going to be at some other product page? Where do you think that segment of traffic is going to want to engage with these screens to be able to take advantage of the offer? So that's my point about identifying your audience. Okay. Everyone looks so serious. It's like killing me. No smiles. Don't, don't smile. Okay. So step three, we have design, designing your incentive. Um, know your metrics, compelling offer, align incentive with brand voice. I'm going to drill into these right now. So um, knowing your metrics is crucial for being able to define the offer. It seems like pretty straightforward, but let me break it down for you and make it really real. If your average order value is $100 and you're trying to put some kind of boundaries in your offer, like a minimum spend, you probably want the minimum spend to be $100 to ensure that you're getting the average order value. Um, if you're giving $20 away and you want to make sure that you're still getting the average order value, then you make it 120 something like that. Anyway, there are lots of things to consider and think through, but it's not rocket science. You just have to make sure it makes sense to your business. So that's my thought there around knowing your metrics and making sure that when you're designing an offer, it makes sense to the fundamentals of your business. Um, now, in addition, we find that referral really takes off when it's the most compelling offer that's on the site. What we tell our clients to do is start strong. So we have a retail customer right now. They offer a 15% off when uh, a new customer hits the site. They're trying to do email collection, and they're using a different vendor to do that. When they wanted to activate referral, they said, well, it's only natural that we provide a 15% off um, discount to the advocate to refer their friend, and then the friend gets 15% off. And we said, well, why would you do that when all you have to do is provide an email and you get 15% off? It doesn't have any incentive to refer a friend when there's no reason to. So we 
created the business case where they'd give a more attractive offer, 20, 25%, 30%, 50%. Um, the more attractive, the better. And remember that instead of just collecting an email that you hope will eventually convert, these are people who are advocating for you. And the, the um, referral loop is closed when that advocate's friend has made a purchase. So effectively, you're getting not just a new person, not just a new lead to come to the site, but a new customer to transact at your site for that person to then take advantage of this offer. So the offer should always be stronger than what's on the site because you're asking for more from the advocate. Um, and it should be compelling, and it should make them want to click on it, and you should start strong. That's my point there. Um, and then finally, aligning the incentive with the brand voice. So some of our clients are larger enterprise um, retail customers that focus on heavy discounts and they have you know, five, six, 10 emails going out every week to various segments of their business to try to get them to come because there's a sale going on. Then we also have other clients who never do any discounting. And so instead of, um, by leveraging the same type of program, we just change the messaging. So instead of it being get 50% off, it's your friend is gifting you $25 different ways of using the program to your advantage to make sure that it's with your brand voice. Um, one of the pitfalls we see is that, especially in our uh, pre-sales prospecting process, when some of these um, brands that try to appeal to a higher end and they want to use the gifting messaging, they don't pursue referral because they think that referral is all about discounts and cheapening their brand when in reality it can be just as powerful as long as you stay with on, within your brand voice and, and message. So that's some more insight for you, okay. <laughs> Tough crowd. <laughs> All right, um, so the next thing is campaign approach. So I talked before about um, a static wid widget um, sitting on your site uh, for everyone that comes to your site. Then we talked about segmentation, how you'd offer that to different people. Well, what if I told you that widget, that concept you're thinking of, could be a multitude of different things for different people. So at Talkable, we consider each, at each set of screens to be a campaign, and we offer different types of campaigns to our client, which is why you would want to invest in a referral solution or a referral platform instead of um, creating one on your own or uh, investing in one of these cheaper solutions that just have uh, you know, one or two, one screen for everyone to see. I'll give you an example of that. Um, we have what we consider to be an evergreen, evergreen campaign where this would sit static on the site for like a long period of time. We often refresh the screens for holidays, whatever. Let's say it's $20, uh, give 20, get 20, and it just stays static, just stays static on the site forever. Pictures, I don't know. Go for it, go for it. Um, so, threw me off. Um, so staying static on the site, um, staying consistent on the site, what we could consider to be an evergreen campaign. So it's evergreen all the time. Then, as part of our you know core competency and services strategy, we try to find ways to engage with our clients and help them create campaigns that are more compelling for their consumers. So we have a um, test test promote strategy where every quarter and each month of the quarter we do uh, a month of testing with comprehensive A-B testing, I'll get into that after, another month of a separate type of test or separate tests with a different theme and then promote. So we have special campaigns that we like to pulse um, so we would either take down the evergreen and show this special campaign for a month um, to drive uh, virality and excitement or keep both of the campaigns the same, depends on the segment, depends on the audience. I'll give you an example. We have a company that we work with called Pure Vita Bracelets. They sell bracelets um, and other fashion accessories and jewelry online. Um, so they had a static program going where the advocate got a dollar off of their first purchase and the friend would get 50% off their first purchase. Um, had been going for a while at the beginning, very exciting, lots of activity, new offer, new way of engaging, et cetera. But after a while, things started to taper off, and there was a need for some kind of excitement. So we introduced the concept of a leaderboard campaign, basically gamification, still making sure that the loop was closed through referral through purchase. So every time an advocate referred a friend, 
and the friend was able to make a purchase that would increment one point of essentially for the advocate. And the advocate with the most number of referrals at the end of this short boundary like specific campaign won a prize. It was a trip to Costa Rica. So out of all the people that are coming to the site already that have already engaged through referral as advocates or they're thinking of engaging for the first time, this is a new and exciting way of engaging uh, with, with the brand. And so what we do is we pulse on and off for different segments at any given time. And the you know, secret sauce and the magic behind what we do is being able to effectively run concurrent campaigns um, to different segments at different times um, all the time. And so that's the beauty of our platform and what we do. Effectively, something for everyone at any given moment. So that's, that's what's there. OK, we keep going. Um, so the, the next step, step number four or five, we have asked for the referral. So um, usually brands or companies at this point are thinking like, all right, I know what my incentive is going to be, but how do I get an advocate to actually take action and invite their friend? You know, is $20 enough? Uh, how do I convince them beyond just telling them that it's $20 towards purchasing something in our store? What type of messaging re resonates, west, uh, resonates best? So what we would advise is having clear and concise messaging where you're explaining exactly what's happening. Um, I've seen situations where prospects and even some customers that are working on their own have created very elaborate uh, referral programs, very referral schemes where it's like, you know, give, give $10, then get $5, but give another $7, and get $3, and get $9, and get $6, and then seeing this all displayed on one screen, which is like a mess. Um, and so we just say, keep it simple, keep it clear and concise, explain what you're going to be getting as the advocate, ex or sorry, explain what the advocate's going to be getting, explain what the friend's going to be getting, and um, make sure that there is um, an urgency behind it. Uh, make the offer seem like it's a limited offer. It could be a coupon code that's uh, generated by you, um, put into our platform, and then provisioned as needed. Um, but we could also put something in there where this coupon expires in 30 days. Um, so there's some type of urgency behind making sure that they're going to be using this and they're going to be taking action because they can't just come back again in the near future and hope that it's still here again. Um, and then finally, building. Yeah. That's a great question. So the question is, is it important to give the advocate more than the friend? And so we actually see the opposite. So it's important to make sure that the advocate is rewarded for the work they're doing, and they're fairly compensated for bringing in a look-alike customer, essentially as a friend. But it's easier for the advocate to um, advocate on your behalf when the friend offer is more attractive than their offer. Um, and so uh, we usually advise against just having an advocate offer. We're always on the same page about making sure that the advocate offer and the friend offer are matched. And in some cases, if you really want to drive engagement, you make sure that the friend offer is better. And then they'll do everything in their power to make sure that if they love your brand, they're going to make sure their friend comes to experience the brand and also make a purchase because the, br the friend is going to be getting something better. Is that helpful? Yeah. Cool. So. Um, Building lasting relationships. So ultimately, uh, the point here is you want to make sure that when you are getting that advocate to take action on your behalf, you know how much you appreciate it, and you know how, and they know how much you appreciate it, and they know um, that you're going to ask for it again. And so, all along the way, the checkpoints of or the milestones, you know, you've referred a friend. Have they actually taken action yet? Have they not? Do I have an opportunity to remind them? What's the flow of the program? How do I engage with the program, et cetera? You want to make sure that it's all clear up front, minimal questions, and make sure that it can just keep going and it's, it's frictionless for the advocate to keep referring their friends. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
let me repeat your question. Let me make sure I get it right. Um, so his question is, if you already have raving fans who are already loyal brand advocates, then why go through the trouble of incenting them to find people that they know as friends when they're probably doing it already? Um, and instead, segment those people out so that you can focus on those that need the push. So the, my viewpoint there is anytime you have a raving fan, as long as you can find a way to capitalize on getting them to find more people that are like them, you to try to do everything in your power to get that. So I actually f I see clients do the opposite, where they segment out the raving fans and provide them with special offers, like more attractive offers. They're usually the people that have, I'll give you an example. We do business with a company that, has, that does um, like high-end bedding, sheets, home accessories, et cetera. And so they've identified that they have three segments of their business. People that come one time and purchase, usually to take advantage of a coupon or because of something, some reason. Then they have like a mid-tier and a high tier. The high tier usually transacts with at least $8,000 in their shopping cart every single time. And then the mid-tier is usually between 500 and 1200 and that's their sweet spot. So when they're thinking like, how can we, we already know that some of these clients are celebrities, they rave about our brand, um, it's already in publications. But hoping that by enjoying the product, they'll continue to advocate for you is different than supplying them with a specific offer that they can take advantage of and win in the process um, to make sure that they keep raving about you. And so that's why there's like this special incentive for these what are considered whale customers to make sure that they keep advocating, they keep coming back, and they have a mechanism to get rewarded as they bring people like themselves into the, into the experience. Helpful? Yep. Okay. Okay, cool. So that's ask for the referral. Um, now I'm going to jump into tracking and optimization. So uh, the beauty of having a platform is that all the data elements and uh, data points can be tracked. Um, attribution is king in referral. I mean, obviously, you want to be able to uh, make sure that the advocate gets attributed properly with the friend and that the friend gets a coupon. Uh, code or whatever to make sure that it gets provisioned properly and make sure that they're not defrauding the program or doing some kind of gamification. We see often um, self-referral, cross-referral, um, about 10 different other types of referral happen. An example of that self-referral is if I had a Matt Belitsky at Gmail and I invited Matt Belitsky at Yahoo. Um, a lot of cheaper solutions out there don't do any type of fraud prevention, so they just let it happen. Um, we prevent it from happening. We have a lot of different levers in our platform that allow all of our clients to determine exactly how they want to program their fraud settings to be. Um, Self-referral is if I have a friend named Daniel, then it's Matt invites Daniel, Daniel invites Matt. Um, another common type of, uh, re of referral fraud, and um, also we block that. We also look at cookie, IP, um, we do a whole bunch of triangulation to determine if it's the same person. We got really strict with our controls recently and we started blocking people who came from the same IP address. We realized that we were preventing you know, um, husbands and wives and kids from referring each other from the same thing, so we kind of relaxed that a little bit, but we made it flexible for our clients and they can, they can choose and detect all the fraud settings that they want uh, in our platform. Um, it's important to make sure that all the information from your program is being aggregated in one place so that you can analyze this information and action on it. Um, having a referral program up without looking at the results is useless. And um, I think that some people think, well, I have to have a referral program because it's a customer acquisition mechanism. And they think as long as I'm getting new customers, it's good enough. But then there's the issue with fraud. It could be fake people coming in. It could be people referring themselves. How do you know that they're actually real? And then also, of those people coming in, what additional insights can you learn to optimize and improve the program? So um, we have a strategy, always be testing, um, always be optimizing, a lot of different flavors for that. Um, in our platform, over the last six months, we've built a comprehensive um, A-B testing suite where we allow um, the multivariate testing to occur within each of the individual screens and campaigns. I'll give you some examples. Within the screens, um, we could do copy, messaging, anything on the fly. And then within, um, within the campaign itself, you could do uh, friend, advocate, or sorry, advocate friend, you could do 
like dollars off versus percentage off. Um, you could do dollars off versus free t-shirt. A lot of different ways to run the same program and test different incentives and have that kind of testing happen live in the moment. Um, and in addition, measure and adjust. Um, you want to make sure that as you're collecting this information and insight, you're constantly adjusting, iterating, um, trying new things, and that's, that's it, five steps. So uh, these five steps are written in depth and detail with a whole bunch of research behind them, examples and everything. Um, in that ebook that I talked about, that's at talkable.com. It's the first thing you see when you go to the site. But before you guys go and download it and start reading it aggressively, let me keep going through the presentation. I have some more surprises at the end. Hopefully, that'll become helpful to you. So I'm going to keep going with some pictures. I know that probably bores you to death with all those slides, but if they were orange, so hopefully that helps brighten your day a little bit. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to walk you through some ideas that I have in my mind of some of the client screens that I've been able to see and, and get for this presentation. So I was talking before about an evergreen campaign. This is Jimbery. Jimbery sells children's clothing. This is their evergreen campaign offer. Now, usually an average order value for Jimbery is around uh, $50, between $40 and $60, depends on what time of the year it is. When it's around the holidays, it gets a little bit higher because of gifting and et cetera. But Usually it's about that. So here we have a referral offer where it's refer a friend and get 20, give 20, get 20. And you can see the various sharing mechanisms that exist for being able to share that offer out. Um, so, sorry, you get 20 and the friend gets 25%. Uh, and it's detailed there in, in, in that explanation. Um, the reason I show you this screen is because in April, uh, Jim Bree celebrated Friendship Month. And so we hid this evergreen campaign and instead showed this version, which is get $30. So this went out to top advocates um, to invite them through an email blast to come and participate. And then everyone who engaged with the program or saw these screens in the month of April was able to take advantage. And there was a, a stricter boundary of time where you had to make sure that the friend made the purchase in the month of April in order for you to get the $30, which also uh, created a sense of urgency for advocates to make sure that not only were they inviting friends, they were inviting friends who were ready to take action now um, for the benefit of Jimbery, but also they were ready to um, remind those friends if they, were, if they had been provisioned some kind of coupon that they need to take action, and we provided the mechanisms for them to do that through reminder emails, et cetera. So that's just my example for you of how to um, have a different offer, um, either for a different segment or for pulsing during different times of the year to be seasonal. Um, and that's just one example. Next, I'm going to jump into uh, Pure Vita bracelets. I mentioned them before. So um, most companies that do referral don't do fraud checks. We do. What we used to do is say, you We've detected fraud. Sorry, no entry. So let's say that uh, an advocate referred a friend. The friend was already a customer. The friend tried to take advantage of an offer. They got to the page. They would see a screen similar to this. And it would say, we're sorry. No way. Good luck another time. So we thought that would curb gamification of programs. But the people who were gaming the system would just get pissed off that we figured out what they were trying to do. And they would try even harder to be more creative in their approach, which was a pain in the ass. So instead, we tried this new thing, which now we rolled out to all of our customers, where if the offer is real, so if this is a, let's say you're, you want to make sure that only new customers are getting, uh, only new customers are getting this friend coupon. So in this example here, you can see, if I'm the advocate and I've referred someone from this audience and you've never been to the site before and you're a new customer, you've taken advantage, you've clicked on a link, you've come to the site, the site's determined you've never been cookie before, you're not a customer, it's done an email match, et cetera, and it's been like, boom, in the moment, there's your coupon code to take advantage of 50% off as the friend. If it was determined along that logic process that you were already a customer or ineligible for some reason, and we can come up with a whole bunch of different reasons, a whole bunch of different screens. Now what we do is say, we're sorry. The 50% off code 
is only for new customers, and instead here is a different offer for you. So we've seen this dramatically curb gamification of programs because those people who are looking for something, some instant gratification out of gaming a system now get some type of instant gratification. It's not the whole kitchen, it's not everything in the kitchen sink, but it's something in the kitchen, and that's good enough for them. So this has helped us a lot. This is like how we're trying to innovate within the referral marketing space, and these are the types of screens we offer out of the box for our customers. Um, next thing I want to show is a different type of campaign. So usually we're talking about, usually we're talking about um, post-purchase, so somebody's made a purchase and on the confirmation page it's like boom, there's a pop-up, and that's typically how most referral programs are set up. We said to ourselves like great, so a purchase has been made, we see great advocacy happening at that moment, person's excited with their purchase, they want to share it, they want to get one of their friends to engage and, and join. But now, what are other points along the customer journey where an advocate can be identified and have an opportunity to share? And so. What we had been doing for a long time, we had this concept of an invite page. An invite page is like a standalone landing page where an advocate could uh, refer a friend without having to make a purchase, um, which we thought was revolutionary and breakthrough at the time. But now everyone does it. And so uh, instead, we're thinking now, well, instead of going to a separate landing page and having that advocate take advantage, how can we prevent interruption in the customer journey? And so what we've implemented now is this concept of a floating widget. So you can see here, floating widgets, like really detailed there. Um, so what I would do is I would see get 25 as the offer and click it. And then in, in frame, I would be able to see what the referral offer is instead of being um, distracted by opening another tab or going to a different page. Uh, instead, I can just see what the referral experience is here. The other things we're able to do with this floating widget, since we have uh, acts, you know, once we do an integration with the e-commerce platform, we have access across the whole site. And then in the Talkable platform, you can program with like easy to use, um, like a WYSIWYG style editor, how you want um, these, these things to show. So effectively, what we could do is have a um, new customer has been identified of hitting the, the website. Um, the floating widget is loaded. And then after five seconds, it automatically expands and shows the offer as if it was a pop-up. Um, it can, once you close out of this, we can close out of this and hide the floating widget. We can close out of this and keep the floating widget, change the icon, make it look different. Um, you can expand it later. It can follow with you and persist through the experience. Basically, a new way of thinking through how we can make sure that the uh, referral offer is always present and also that it is not distracting away too much from the customer journey. So that's my example there. Another thing that we've um, started doing, we, I, I am familiar that a couple of other vendors out there in different categories have s had this before, but one of the core benefits we have is after I'm the advocate and I've referred a friend and the friend has come and gotten that coupon like you saw for Pura Vida, the next step is obviously to go and shop. Now, shopping for bracelets, Shopping for some certain things might be a quick decision because maybe your site doesn't have a lot of selection. Maybe it's easy to make a decision. You want to make a decision quickly. Sometimes it takes forever to make a purchase. You really, you, you add like five shirts to the cart, then you're like, oh, I don't know if I really want this. Should I get blue or black or I don't know. And so over the course of the decision process, when it could take you know, two days, 10 days, 30 days, 40 days, Along the way, you might have forgotten that the reason you came to the site in the first place was because you were referred to use this coupon. So it might be, we obviously send an email, but maybe it's buried by that point, you don't have it. So what we started to do um, as an out of the box campaign is offer what we call a gleam. And this is a persistent bar on the bottom of the screen that only people, only the friends who have successfully gotten a coupon are able to see uh, persistently through their experience on your website so that they know to take advantage and remind them to take advantage. The other thing we can do here is, um, is let them know that the coupon will be auto-applied and or we can show when the coupon will expire um, to make sure that there's urgency to know that they have to make a purchase soon. We can change the formatting of it. We can make a whole bunch of different things happen, but it's a new way of making sure that the purchase does happen or try to make sure we can do everything to make it happen. One more thing I want to show you. This is very exciting. Um, 
So usually when a client has, um, has a desktop experience, um, they probably have a mobile, or what we sometimes call M dot, um, mobile responsive experience, where the same pages load and render on iPads and iPhones and Androids, et cetera, but with the kind of design and element of those screens to make sure that the um, user experience isn't broken. Um, to now, to, 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 to recently, we understood that in order for us to be able to use a share, so we use Facebook and email and all these sharing channels to allow advocates to engage with their friends to make sure their friends are getting these offers. But what we had known is that in order to do SMS sharing, we needed to do a native app integration. So uh, you needed to have a native app, we needed to have access to your contact book, book and we needed to be able to um, have it set up so that it was basically it's like a deeper integration to set up a native mobile app or integrate through the iOS SDK or the Android SDK. So what we're able to do is figure out a workaround where on a M dot or mobile responsive page, we can identify that you're coming from a device that is mobile in nature, and we're able to offer this share by SMS button. It's it can look any way possible, but out of the box this is how it looks. And when you click it, we've come up with a workaround um, that you don't need an iOS or Android SDK to share via SMS in the native uh, application of the phone. And so here you can see that a new message has been created with the uh, text that's pre-populated for Spire. And then right here, I'm in my messaging application. I can enter in my friend's contact and send it, and done. So we've been able to offer SMS sharing out of the box to all of our clients um, on any mobile experience as of weeks ago. And that's very exciting for us because it's a new sharing channel that's proving to be very effective. We find that the one-to-one peer-to-peer -one -peer relationship when you have with someone is usually more advantageous to getting someone to take action than you blasting out on your Facebook timeline or to a whole bunch of people to take action because it's less personalized. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I would. I don't. It's different for every client. Um, I would say pretty high. I'll. I'll. I'll, I'll qualify that for you though. Um, we used to see email doing, I would say, 60% of the traffic, and then we would have other channels like Facebook doing less than that. Then we started doing tests of how about if we offer email versus Facebook, email and Facebook Messenger versus email and Facebook Timeline. And then we started to see like a more equal expanse of both um, Facebook Messenger and email because it's that one-to-one -one peer relationship. And now with the introduction of mobile through SMS, um, it's almost equal, but only on mobile devices because that's the only place you can access it. So the bulk of most of our programs right now, um, the sharing and the, the action and the shopping all takes place from the advocate point of view, from the desktop. We, we see it as a helpful thing to be on mobile, but we haven't seen, we find that most people are usually trying to do, and, and again, I'm not a mobile expert, but we're trying to get into the space and do more research here. I'd love to write another ebook about this. Um, usually, people are looking to transact on desktop um, for things that they've never transacted before, which are most of our clients, new, innovative, cool products with videos and lots of things to look at, versus your phone, which is what we find used for quick transactions, like reordering something on Amazon, ordering food, ordering an Uber, you've done it before, you know how to do it, it's quick and easy. Um, or you want to check the news or check something quickly. So if you really want the brand experience, which is what most of the consumers want when they come to these referral platforms, they usually want the bigger desktop experience and they want that whole like shopping experience on their own. Cool? Cool. All right, so I'm going to kind of wind this down a little bit, get into do's and don'ts, and then take some questions if you have any. Um, so here we have do's and don'ts. Do define your objectives. I mean, this is straightforward, but most, m many people do not. They just think, we need a referral program. Great, excited for you. What are you gonna do with it? Well, we just need to turn it on. Okay, and that's where we start to get into the qualification questions and really understand what's going on. Define your audience, you know. Great, we've identified that you wanna give $20 away because you think referral works because you've seen it on Uber. 
and you want to use it for your e-commerce store, who are you going to offer this to? Everyone? Some people? Do you have better customers than others? How does your customer base work? So most of my qualification questions during our sales process are like, how does your business work? How do you do segmentation now? All that kind of stuff. And I'm sure you guys have thought through all of this because you're in this stage right now. Then we have use the campaign approach. Um, don't. We have a, in our sales pitch, we have a line that says, um, why use a static, boring program when you could leverage the campaign approach and offer multiple campaigns to different segments of your business? Something like that. Sounds better when they say it. But anyway, campaign approach, making sure you're able to offer new, exciting, fresh offers. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, that Jimboree example. Uh, so effectively, you're giving away more margin from the purchase uh, because you're discounting more heavily. Um, but at the same time, uh, hopefully, and this is why we track the numbers and everything, you want to um, create virality, engagement, and excitement. And by putting the bounds on this campaign specifically for April, that uh, the friend had to take action in April, it was a reason for the advocates to do the heavy lifting to make sure their friends were making purchases. And April was one of the most successful months for Jimbery um, in general for referral and for their other businesses, business um, acquisition tools because of the fact that there were so many people engaged in making sure that this was happening and they were getting rewarded and incentivized. So. Well, sorry, so he's saying, uh, why wouldn't we give it to everyone instead of just uh, during just that month? Yeah, so let me clarify. So uh, just to clarify what he's saying, he's wondering if we gave it to the most um, active customers. So. Uh, this offer was available to everyone in the month of of April, but what I'm saying is, in the example before, just to clarify, this could be offered to a specific segment. So in that example, if you um, you would probably give a more attractive thirty, fifty, hundred dollar offer or something to those customers that you knew would be spending more, uh, so that they would find more people like themselves. Yeah. That's right, and also you want to make sure there's a minimum spend to use these coupons. So if you're giving away $100 to put towards a $500 minimum purchase, it's a tougher sell for someone that's used to spending $100, but if someone's used to spending $1,000, then that person who's already spending the $1,000, $2,000 probably has an idea in their head of their friend peer group who they would want to refer who could also do that. So that's the advantage of offering more. Yeah, do you, so um, two points of clarification. So the question is, um, uh, is it better, I'm just going to paraphrase, is it uh, advantageous to make sure that the referral happens once or twice? Um, and, how, and sorry, can you say it again? Yeah, yeah. So let me give you some more insight into this. Um, I'll clarify what this example is showing. So the advocate gets $30 for every friend that comes in, and the friend gets 25% off. So this is a m more beneficial in this case for the advocate, and it's only for the month of April. So usually they get $20 off for each friend that they refer, but in this case they're getting it $30 in April. Usually, so to answer your question, usually the um, if the friend comes in to take action for the from the first offer, and they're provisioned a coupon, if they came back for a second time, they wouldn't be eligible because they are not considered a new customer anymore. So that's one way to look at it. And uh, if they didn't take action the first time, and they never clicked on any link or anything, then technically maybe a better offer would help. But we haven't done a lot of testing around that. But it's definitely something to try. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Yeah. We, um, so the question is, is there on a curve, like have we found the optimal sweet spot? So um, we do business with enterprise companies, um, emerging growth companies, and like smaller companies. And so it's different for each of them because they obviously have different types of products. Some of them sell products that are thousands of dollars. Some of them sell products that are $10. And so it really depends on the, the price of the product, your average order value, your own internal metrics. That's why creating the incentive based on your own metrics is so important. Um, I don't have like any broad uh, curves or anything that's helpful. What I do know is of the offers that are currently on your site now, you must have an inkling of what's working and not working. And so I would assume that if you were to introduce referral, since you're asking for a new customer instead of just giving away some kind of discount, you probably want to try more than what you're currently doing. Now, in the case of Pura Vida, they're like, okay, well, we currently give 25% away. You know, what if we gave 50% away? How much improvement would that generate for us? So we ran a multivariate test of giving away to the friend 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, percent off, and we were able to show that even though 50% off was deteriorating against margins more than the other ones, it was bringing in such a substantial more amount of, custo of new customers that that's what they stuck with. And that's the kind of testing that you can do on our platform. It's easy to do. Yes, sir. Great question. So that's the question is like, what's the difference between the multivariate test there? So as you can imagine, the higher the offer, the more engagement. Um, but what we found is that the difference between 40% and 50% was pretty neg negligible, but 50% um, still performed better. And so ultimately the client said, I should choose 40, that's the smart decision here, but I want everyone possible to come in as a new customer, and I don't want to give away 60%, so I'm going to go with 50%. So that's what they chose. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we want to patients, uh, so it's a great question. So this question is, um, is it possible to reward in non-monetary incentives? And how would that be set up in potentially a regulatory industry? So we do business right now with um, a lot of vaporizer companies. Uh, they're highly regulated. They can't do, um, you know, it's, it's irresponsible to offer some certain dollar off to um, promote uh, um, like they can't give away free product because it's, it shows that it's irresponsible, et cetera. So they're working within the boundaries of what they can do. Um, we're able to test monetary and non-monetary incentives against each other at the same time in our platform. Um, I was saying before we could do like give away a free t-shirt. So the advocate gets a t-shirt and the friend gets a t-shirt. Um, could be we have a Highline Coffee as a new customer of ours. They're giving away a tumbler uh, to their to new, new customers. So there's like a lot of a lot that's out there that you could do. Um, another thing to mention is um, well, I, I don't know. I, I think that's, that's, not, that's enough. I, I have a little bit more after the do's and don'ts to share with you, and then I want to get back into answering more of that question. Okay? So, using the campaign approach, keep it fresh, good to go. I'm going to go through the don'ts quickly. Don't confuse people. Don't make the offer too difficult to understand. They're going to bounce. They're not going to understand what's going on. Don't ignore fraud. That's something that no one thinks of until you've been burned badly. But why do that when you can be proactive about it? Um, then don't forget about service. So ultimately, um, and I don't want to do a full sales pitch for what we offer, but in our product, we have created this um, new login portal for customer service reps. So usually what used to happen in the past is a consumer would have a question about the referral transaction. Like, I referred my friend, but I didn't get the coupon or something. Something happened along the way. Now, our system probably detected if they were self-referred, but that wasn't communicated to the original um, recipient. And so what happens is they call the 800 number, they get in touch, then the customer service opens an inquiry, they get in touch with their marketing team, the marketing team gets in touch with us, and there's this like long cycle to be able to close the loop. So what we've been able to do is create a self-service portal for customer service reps from these companies to go in and log in and, and use that. Um, and we said, this is great for enterprise companies that have hundreds of reps that can just go in and self-serve and we don't have to get involved, the marketers don't have to get involved. But 
anyone would find this helpful. So it's now a functionality out of the box. Um, we're constantly making improvements to it. Any part of the order transaction or the information of the, ref the advocate or the friend, so email address, order number, whatever, you enter it into that and then you can query and see all the details about the referral and take any kind of action that's needed. So um, don't forget about service, don't forget there's gonna be questions and the more um, proactive you are in getting those, the messaging right to prevent those questions, self -serv the uh, customer service portal is one thing and another thing that we offer is the ability for a dashboard campaign where in the My Account section of if you're an e-commerce company or a similar subscription company, you can go in at any given moment and see the status of all of the referrals you've made and be able to take action by sending reminder emails, et cetera. So we're all about promoting self-service, and that's that. And then finally, I have Don't Build It From Scratch because um, most many companies say, hey, we're gonna build this from scratch because it's so easy. They don't take into account any of these other things. And um, they end up being like, this wasn't, a, this wasn't a fit for us, or this isn't working. Or they come to a solution like ours, and um, I just wanted to let you know that um, as of today going forward, we have a new um, type of account called Community, um, where we will invite anyone to come to our site, um, sign up at this link, which is not yet uh, public, so you might want to write this down. Um, and after you click this, you can click your e-commerce platform or your custom platform or whatever you use to do transactions and you can have access to all the stuff I was talking about for free um, until you make a certain threshold of transactions um, through the platform. But it's high and you shouldn't have to worry about that. So I just want to let you guys know that you're all welcome to this. And I think the slides are available. You can take a picture if you want. Tweet it. OK, slides are up. Anyway, so there you go. So definitely click on this link. You're going to go through our new release slash beta process of this wizard that we've created. Our business has really been focused over the last two years of servicing enterprise with account managers and building up this up. But now uh, we want to do is, since we've made so many improvements to the UX um, within our platform to promote self-service as the marketer, as the developer, et cetera, we've created flows um, for people to self-serve and onboard themselves to do that. So that's what this represents. So please go ahead and um, if you have questions, there's places in there to ask questions and documentation, et cetera. Um, so that's it. So today we talked about why referral marketing works, five steps to building your program, and then referral do's and don'ts. And I'm Matt Bolitsky from Talkable. Any questions? Yeah. So the, the best practice that we have is what we say to everyone, but your business could be totally different. Um, that quarterly strategy of uh, test, test, promote, we usually use that one month of promotion as a way to drive additional traffic to, the, to this special offer. Um, and then after it's done, all the new people that were acquired as a part of that, as friends, to invite them to be advocates during the Evergreen program after that. So usually it's once a quarter towards the end of the quarter when you're trying to drive sales for your business and you want to just pump a whole large volume. You do a big promotional blast. Here's a special offer. Take advantage of it. Come to the site. See that happen. So that's, that's one part. And then, um, yeah, I guess, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, great question. So we have, by default, um, we have some screens. I mean, this is hopefully you log into the platform and activate this on your on your own. But um, we have the option where you can have the advocate check a box where it says, "If my friend hasn't taken action, remind them automatically in three days." And so the email would come like from the advocate, and then it comes from the advocate again, reminding them to take action. Um, and then within that self-service portal, which we consider to be a dashboard campaign, which you also have access to, um, once you set it up in the My Account section, they can go at any time. Um, before or after that three-day period and click send reminder email. Um, some clients don't like reminder, reminder emails going in all the time, so there's only other option potentially to send it one time. It really depends on your business rules and how flexible you are with communication. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, it, most of the clients that we see large volumes of uh, 
like data are around um, comparing dollars versus percent or dollars and dollars and percent and percent. We don't see uh, a huge volume of the non-monetary um, transactions happening versus like a dollar off or something because we don't have a lot of customers that are interested in pursuing that. The reason we built it into our platform is for scale because we hope that with new companies coming on board that we can try and test that out. We have the full capabilities of doing a real A-B test to determine that, just we don't have any real results to share yet. Yes. Anything else? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, if I can call it an affiliate program, is that fair? Yeah. yeah. So uh, affiliate marketing, referral marketing, a little bit different. Affiliate marketing, the incentives are around the advocate getting paid in cash. Um, think of celebrities that get in, that do an endorsement for a brand, they get paid in cash, they tweet it out to all these people, they all of a sudden have new customers. Um, we're different because it's all about the two-sided offer, making sure that the purchase happens on the site, that it's towards a, a future purchase, first purchase for the friend, future purchase for the advocate, and it happens on your site. Um, some companies who have the ability to run referral um, might have started with affiliate marketing, and they've said to themselves, wow, you know, referral makes more sense for our business because we're paying out cash right now and it doesn't really do us any good. Uh, so they often switch to us. So we get a lot of inbound inquiries into our sales, um, you know, action, call to actions on the site where they're like, hey, I'm running an affiliate program. I just want to migrate this over to referral. Is that possible? And of course it is. It's stuff we do all the time. We just don't pay out cash incentives. That's how we distinguish ourselves from affiliate. We do uh, coupons and we can even do Amazon gift cards um, as an incentive type. So that's a different type of incentive we do. Um, we have a company that's a customer called Plastic. Plastic, they make a credit card. They haven't released it yet, but they've been in a pre-order for a long time. Once you, the advocate, um, have purchased a plastic card, you probably don't want to purchase another plastic card because you don't really need more than one. So the incentive for you, after you've made a purchase, is to get an Amazon gift card. And effectively, as you're able to stack these Amazon gift cards up, uh, you're able to pay for the purchase you made um, originally to get the card in the first place. So definitely something you can do. Yep. Yeah. That's a great question. So the different types of campaigns that we have, so that floating widget campaign is an opportunity for uh, a visitor to become an advocate before a purchase is made. So maybe it'll incentivize that person to become an advocate and then make the purchase for the first time, but not necessarily make a purchase to then become the advocate. Yeah, so we started, we were the first uh, post-purchase pop-up ever. Um, that's our claim to fame in our, in our campaigns and everything. And since then, we've seen obviously post-purchase has great um, that's when somebody's made a purchase, they want to share their experience, they want to brag about it, there's a mechanism to do so through a two-sided reward. Still performs very well. Um, but if you want to make sure that the advocate, advocacy can happen before, then there's an opportunity to do so. It really does depend on different companies. Um, there are some companies who don't offer post-purchase. They just they have other pop-ups they want to do, like a, an upsell opportunity at that moment, so they don't have an opportunity to do referral, so they just have it on their site. And we've seen, um, you know, we pit the campaigns against each other to see how they do this. It's always different. But usually post-purchase is the easiest one because you're asking for it right after the purchase has been made. But there have been great experiences of seeing it across other, other ones. I'm starting to lose the room, so I think one more question if anyone has any, or we'll just call it, call it a day. All good? Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you.